It's good to see all of you as we uh, jump into week three in this series, The Stories in the Story. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to uh, the book of Ruth. I'll give you a few minutes to turn there before we start uh, reading. Uh, I encourage you, if you've not so far gotten uh, one of the journals, the journals that uh, are a companion to this uh, study uh, that we're going through over the next uh, several weeks. Gives you some extra materials that you can uh, look at these books of the Bible that we're going through through the, through the week, places for sermon notes, uh, all those kind of things. So I encourage you to pick one of those up. You can still do that out in the lobby, in the lobby today. Uh, and so as we think about this larger story of Scripture and what God is up to, we always want to kind of look at the big, big theme, but then how... Uh, each week, how is what God's doing in the big story, how does that impact us uh, in our own lives personally? And one of the things that I think it just helps us to see that big story, I was reading a book, I shared this with you last week, but I just want to just remind you, it gives us a framework for what we're talking about. Uh, Brian Dolan in a book called Bible, The Bible Journey, uh, he talks about six acts that we see through from Genesis to Revelation, these six acts that help us to somewhat understand the big, big meta-narrative, the big, big overarching story. And so I want to just remind you of these uh, six acts. And so it starts with Act 1, creation. We see that in the book of Genesis at the very beginning that God establishes his kingdom. He creates, and it's very good, he says. And then we move to the second act, the fall, rebellion in the kingdom. Adam and Eve in the garden, they sin. Uh, and so they get uh, the kingdom off track and break the relationship that, that you know, humanity has with God. And so uh, we know that that is all of our story as well, that we have all sinned, we've all fallen short. Scripture talks about that. Does anybody want to uh, stand up and share a little of your own personal journey? <laughs> because this is, a, this is a common theme, we all have this issue. Okay, so uh, the fall, rebellion of the kingdom. Then Act 3 is redemption initiated, that God chooses Israel, that he, uh, he has this plan that he begins to unfold, and we see that one of the key parts of the plan is choosing Israel to be, uh, to be the, the vehicle through which the Redeemer would come, the Messiah would come, the way that he would he'd get the word out to the world. And, and so we see this is part of his plan. And so we see that kingdom initiated in Act, uh, redemption initiated in Act 3. Act 4 is, is redemption accomplished. It's the coming uh, of the King. It's Jesus coming. It's him, uh, his life, his death, his resurrection that makes our redemption, our relationship to be to be put back together with God, possible in Act 4, redemption accomplished. In Act 5, we have the mission of the church, spreading the news of the king. And we see through the latter part of the New Testament, we see the church on mission, the church spreading the news, planting churches, and, and, and all of that. And we know that, we understand that we are in this act. The mission of the church is us now, that we're, we're on mission, we're working together in our community, around the world. This is us. We are right, continuing to write the story of what God is up to in our world as we help through the mission of the church of spreading the news of the king. That's what we're up to here at First Church. And then the, the final act is the redemption completed. It's not yet accomplished, but it is the return of the king. Jesus is coming again, and we see the kingdom or the redemption, redemption completed as Jesus returns. And so that, those are those six acts that you can see from Genesis to Revelation. And we're, through this series, looking at selected uh, books of the Bible, uh, overviews, and picking out some, some pieces to understand that big story, but also then understanding how we fit personally into the story and how it relates to us and what a difference it makes in our own lives personally. And so each week we'll, 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 we'll understand how we fit into those six acts and how what we're talking about kind of fits and, and all that. And so this week we're going to look at the book of Ruth. Ruth is a really short, it's a, it's a really compressed short story, really. It's 85 verses spread out over four chapters. And I think the word redeem, redeemer, some variation of that word is found some 20 times. So if you're wondering what the theme is, that might help you understand what the theme is of of this, of this, uh, of this book of Ruth. So let's start, uh, set the stage as we think about the the book of Ruth and how it fits into this larger story of what God's up to. We left last week 
Uh, In the book of Exodus, God's people had been rescued, delivered out of their slavery in Egypt, and they had crossed the Red Sea, they had come into the Sinai Peninsula, they had come to Mount Sinai, we talked about that last week, God uh, then makes covenant with them, they are given the law, and then they are on their way toward the promised land, the land that God had promised them. They get to the brink of the promised land. They doubt, they don't think they can do it, they don't trust God enough to, to, to take the land, and so because of that, their disobedience there, they wander around for 40 years. And that generation dies off, a new generation is born, and now this generation does enter the promised land, does uh, believe that they can, and so they, they, uh, they, they take the promised land after that, that, that detour but, uh, and settle there in the promised land, but things don't go well. They don't exactly do what God told them to do. I think we've all had that as part of our journey as well. We, we, we follow God, but we, we're not all in necessarily, and that's what we, we see, and trouble ensues when we kind of sort of maybe follow God, and so they were kind of sort of maybe following God, and, and so as a result of that, they continually these generations that follow slip in and out of idol worship, uh, taking up the false gods of the neighbors around them. And so uh, God had warned them what would happen if they didn't follow him totally. And we see as a result of, of them not following him totally that Israel then is in this period of instability during what's called the time of the judges. Now, right before Ruth, there's a book called Judges, and it outlines this up and down uh, period of instability. And this is prior to uh, Israel having kings. It was during this time of the Judges. And there is, again, as I said, instability, there's moral decline, there's spiritual disobedience. And there's a great summary of what was going on through this period at the end of the book of Judges in chapter 21, verse 25, and it says this, a good summary of what was going on. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So we look around our world. Look around our, the nation that we live in. The larger world. We see that that's a great parallel to the world that we live. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. We live in a world that nobody wants anybody to tell them what's, what to do or what not to do. Nobody wants to t- be told what's right and wrong. We all want to make our own decisions. That's the world that we live in, and it's just like what we see in the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so into this time of instability, famine strikes the land, and that leads Naomi, who's a key player in the story, Naomi with her family, her husband and two boys, to leave the promised land and go to a neighboring land, Moab, and Moab actually was, a, was an enemy of Israel. And instead of leaning in to trusting God during this difficult time, this, this, this struggle, time of struggle in, in the midst of this famine, they decide that, hey, we're going to do our own thing. We're, we're going we're, we're to work this out on our own. And so they leave the promised land. Again, if we, as we think of our own story, probably most of us have a chapter with a heading that's similar. All right, God, I know what you said, but I, I got this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my own thing. And we have some of that written into our story. And so they leave Bethlehem, this area they're from, uh, and they travel to Moab, again, this neighboring foreign land, outside the promised land, enemy to Israel, and that's where Ruth comes into the story. She was a Moabite. She wasn't uh, from Israel. She wasn't one of the uh, descendants of Abraham. She was outside of what was kind of known as God's people in the time. And, And so that her presence in this story just opens an entirely new chapter of God's unfolding story of redemption. And we're going to get into that story. Now, I thought a fun way for us to understand this story, to help us kind of understand it, would be to go back to literature class. Anybody enjoy literature class? I always enjoyed literature class. Grammar, not so much. Uh, but literature class, I enjoyed I loved reading the, the you know short story stories. I, I enjoy that. And so when you're in Uh, literature class, one way to look at a story is to break it into some different parts. And so uh, let's think about doing that. And so uh, if you look at a story, one of the things you can do is to to, to think about the exposition of the story. The exposition of the story is the where you set, where you understand the the the, the foundation of the story. You set the stage for the story. You, you identify the main characters of the story. So that's the exposition of the story. 
Another part of the story is the rising action. The rising action is where the tension in the story builds. It's where the journey begins to unfold is the uh, is the rising action. Then you come to the climax of the story. The climax is the turning point of the story where everything changes. And then following the climax, you have the falling action. That's where the story begins to revol- resolve itself till finally you get to that final part of the story, and that's the resolution or the story's conclusion. Now, to help us understand what we're talking about, let's take a story that, of another woman that probably all of us know. Um, let's see if we recognize her, the, her picture. Does everybody recognize who this is? This is Cinderella. Uh, and let's just, let, let's just take her story and, and break it into those parts. And so uh, we start with the exposition. What was going on? What's the, what's the foundation of the story? Who are the main characters of the story? Uh, the story of Cinderella opens with her living in the home of the wicked, evil stepmother and the stepsisters. And they treat her like a servant in uh, the home, and so it's just not a, not a good scene. And then we have the rising action where Cinderella dreams of being able to go to the royal ball. And uh, with the help of the fairy godmother, she gets her chance uh, with the limitation that you've got to be out of there by midnight. So that's the, the rising action. Then we have the climax of, of, of Cinderella, and she's at the ball, and she meets the prince, and she dances with the prince, and they're beginning to fall in love, and then the, the, the clock is you're about to strike midnight, and she runs out, and she loses her uh, glass slipper as she's leaving the ball. And then we have the falling action where the prince then takes that slipper, and he's searching the kingdom for the owner of the glass slipper. And then the resolution is the prince finding Cinderella, them reuniting, her becoming his bride, and they lived happily ever. This is crowd participation time. They lived happily ever after. Okay, that's a, that's a good story. And so let's apply that same thing to this, this story, this framework, to the story of Ruth. And so take your Bible, turn with me to Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, and let's think about the exposition. What's the, what's the foundation? What's going on in the story? What's the, what's the setting of the story? And who are the main characters of the story? Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, in the, day, in the days when the judges ruled. That's the setting. It was the time of the judges. Everyone, what did we say? What was, the, what was going on? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They weren't following God. They weren't, they weren't all in. They weren't following his precepts and his principles and the law that had been given them. They had broken covenant with him. And typically, it does not go so well for us when we abandon God and we want to do our own thing. And it says in that next part, there was famine in the land, and the man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his sons were Malon and Chilon, and they were, they were Ephrathites from, the, from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went into the country of Moab, and that, if you have your Bible maps or whatever, you can look it up, and you can see where Israel is in Bethlehem, and, and about 60 miles to the east, a little bit south, you see the... Uh, the nation of Moab. And so that's where it is, about 60 miles or so. And it says, and they remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilon died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So, the setup, or the, the, what's going on, the foundation of the story, is tragedy. One tragedy after another. The tragedy of God's people in this, this, this season, this time of the judges, doing their own thing and abandoning their relationship with God, ignoring God's command, breaking covenant with Him. That was a, a tragic time. And we don't know exactly, it seems like you can connect the dots between their disobedience and God warning them, you know, it's not going to go well for them, and this famine that has come into the land. Now, we don't know that, doesn't say that exactly, but I think we could probably connect the dots that, that, that the two things are related. But whatever is going on, there is famine in the land, the tragedy of the famine, and then the tragedy of, of Naomi, her husband Elimelech, their two uh, boys, and them thinking that they can't trust God enough in the midst of living in the promised land, that they can't trust God if they would just faithfully serve him, that they have to go out on their own and do their own thing and try to make their own way outside of the promised land in this land of Moab. That's tragic that they're at a point where they can't trust God. 
And then we have the tragedy in, that comes into the family, the tragedy of Elimelech, the husband's death, and then the tragedy of, 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 of Naomi, whose sons had married uh, Moabite women, but then both of them die, and there's no heirs, there's no children, and so there's no one to, you know, to, to continue the line, Elimelech's line. And so in these five, first five verses, we see tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. Now Naomi is here in this foreign land, All of her immediate family are gone, destitute with these two daughters-in-law. The entire situation that says that it should have been about 10 years is a decade filled with tragedy. And so let's move to that next part of the story and move to the rising action where the tension begins to build in the story. And the tension builds as Naomi decides, well, I'm going to go back. I I don't really, these are not my people, uh, people of Moab, and so I'm going to go back because in verse 6 it says that that, that God... Uh, visited her people and gives them food. And so the famine, in other words, is over. And so she, she decides, well, I've got family back there. I know people back there. I, uh, I'm going to go back to where I'm from in Bethlehem in the Promised Land. And so she is going back, and she tells her two daughter-in-laws as she sets out, uh, Orpah and Ruth, hey, you, you need to stay in Moab. Uh, you'll have opportunities to marry. Uh, you'll be able to start a family. Uh, you know, I, I'm not having any more kids. I don't have any other sons. So you, there's no one for you to, if you follow me, uh, it's a dead end. I am, and she talks about, she's bitter. We see that in verse 13. That's not my words. It's her own words describing herself. Uh, she's just a, a, a bitter person. Call me Mara. I'm just bitter. And so they argue back and forth. And Naomi says, no, you need to go back. And they're like, no, we want to go with you. And Ruth is all in. And so she commits, no, I'm going with you. Your people are going to be my people. I'm, I'm following you. But then Oprah, she ends up deciding to take Naomi's advice. And so she's going to stay in Moab where she becomes a global mogul, a media mogul, and a billionaire. Oh, no, that's Oprah, not Orpa. Now, sidebar, Oprah actually is named after Orpa. They just, on her birth certificate, spelled it wrong. So just, she just went with, with or- Oprah instead of Orpa. Just a little FYI, I thought you might need a little fun fact in case you're going to a trivia night later. Uh, that'll help you out. Okay, so, so Orpah goes, Ruth stays, and now here they are, and she says, verse 15 of chapter 1, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. You need to go with Orpah, Naomi tells her. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you, for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And so this is that classic line. If we don't know much else about Ruth, we, we recognize this line where she says, no, your people are going to be my people. Your God's going to be my God. I'm going to go where you go. And wait. basically she's saying, I'm embracing your God. I'm going with you. Your people are going to be my people. I'm, I'm leaving Moab. I'm going with you. Verse 17, and where you die, I will die, she goes on to say, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. And so that settles it. And so Naomi and Ruth set off for Israel, going to, the, or to settle in the area where she's from, Naomi's from, in Bethlehem. Now, an interesting thing that was in the law, in the culture of, of, of their people, was something called a kinsman redeemer. If you've been here for a couple of years, you might remember that we talked about, we went through the book of Ruth a couple of years ago, and we talked about the kinsman redeemer, but for those of you who maybe are new, or for those of you who have slept since then and don't remember everything I have to say, which is probably most of you, um, let me refresh you as to what a kinsman redeemer is. A kinsman redeemer is uh, basically when a close relative is responsible for protecting the family name, their line, their welfare. If a man died uh, without an heir, the kinsman redeemer would marry the widow uh, to preserve the family line and then redeem the land so it wouldn't be lost to that family line, that family name. And so uh, that happened sometimes because of death. They would lose the land or sometimes uh, death, which we see in this case. And so with that in mind, that this idea of a potential kinsman redeemer, as they come back into this, into the, to the area, Naomi and Ruth back in, uh, in Bethlehem and Israel in chapter 2, it says this. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now remember, Naomi's wife, or husband, Naomi's husband, 
He, his name's Elimelech. So these, Boaz and Elimelech then are from the same clan. They're from the same tribe. They're related. And so he is a potential, just put a little asterisk, just remember that, he's a potential kinsman redeemer. Verse 2, and Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, uh, let me go into the field and glean among the ears of the grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. So she just happens to go. And I just want just a little footnote. Just remember what we are seeing here is the providence of God. That God in our lives has a way of working situations and working his will, his, his, uh, our lives into the direction, his purposes, both for this big story and our individual story. Uh, okay, so we've talked about this rising action, and we just see in this rising action that God is up to something. We can kind of see it happening. And so that brings us to the climax of the story. And the climax of the story is Cinderella at the ball, dancing with the prince, with the, 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 the clock is about to strike midnight, and what's she going to do? So we skip to chapter 4 to see the climax. Boaz has seen Ruth in the field. It talks about her having been gleaning in the field. And gleaning, uh, he's, you know, notices how hard she works. She's been providing for both herself and Naomi, her mother-in-law. And he appreciates this hard-working uh, Moabite uh, individual in his, in his fields. And Jewish law had set up where gleaning was a thing. And gleaning is when you go into a field, uh, the, the harvesters would leave, were supposed to leave the edges of the field unharvested. And then if they drop stuff, they weren't supposed to pick it up. They're supposed, supposed to leave it there so that the poor, de- destitute foreigners in the land could pick that up and be able to survive. So it was a, a safety net, a social safety net, in other words, uh, that was kind of baked into the way that they were organized. And so in Leviticus chapter, Leviticus chapter 19, if you want to see that, you can see how God had commanded that as a law, that gleaning was a thing. And so that's what she was doing. And through, so through these interactions, she had gotten to know Boaz. And they developed a little bit of a relationship. And so Naomi says to Ruth, hey, you ought to go. Uh, He's going to, in chapter 3, Boaz is going to be at the threshing floor tonight. You ought to talk to him about being your kinsman redeemer. And so we don't have time to go into that whole scene, but you should read it later. That's chapter 3. And basically she goes, she shows up, and she entertains to or just uh, says to, to, to Boaz, maybe you could be the kinsman redeemer. And let me just, sum, sum, sur, just summarize it by saying that, that Boaz thinks that's just a fine idea. Okay. All right. So he's like, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> but he says, and I don't know if you're familiar with the term dibs. Dibs was a thing even back in their day. And Boaz says, yeah, I'd love to do that, but there's somebody that's got dibs. There's somebody that's a closer relation uh, to you and to Naomi than I am. And so uh, I will tomorrow go and I'll talk to the guy that's got dibs and we'll see if he wants to redeem you. And if he doesn't uh, want to be your kinsman redeemer, I absolutely do. And I'll take care of it. You can trust me. And I just want us to see too that this, again, we see these little pictures. We see these little glimpses. We see these little fingerprints that Boaz is just like when he says, you can trust me. I promise you I'm going to take care of this. I'm gonna be, I'll be your redeemer. I'll make sure that you have one, that that is God. Through the pages of Scripture from Genesis, we see, we see a prophetic word, even the book of Genesis, and we see it all throughout, throughout Scripture that God keeps repeating this refrain that I've got you. I promise I will make a way of Messiah. A redeemer is coming. You can trust me. And Boaz says, in the morning, I'm going to take care of it. And he does that. And so here's the climax of the story. Boaz showing up the city gate where those kind of things got worked out in their culture. And he goes and he meets with this potential kinsman redeemer. And he says in verse 3 of chapter 4, and then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who's come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. Remember, Elimelech is Naomi's husband that died. And so he's saying to him, hey, we're both related to Elimelech. He's part of our extended family. And so one of us should be the kinsman redeemer for this family and buy this land so that his name is not lost. And so, and so I thought I would tell you, Boaz says to this guy with dibs, so I thought I would tell you of it 
and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. And if you'll redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there's no one besides you to redeem it. And I come after you. And he said, this guy does. He says, I'll redeem it. Now, if this was a TV drama, this would be the moment that they cut to commercial and then they say, come back next week and we'll see what happens. Okay, because the guy is like, oh, that Boaz is talking to the guy with dibs. He's like, okay, yeah, I'll redeem the land. Sure, I can do that. Okay, so then the rest of the story, then Boaz, because this is the climactic moment. And Boaz says, the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, oh, by the way, you'll also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. And then the Redeemer said, well, I can't redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Now I'm just spitballing, but I'm thinking there might be a, what, another wife involved that he's kind of thinking about, that he's going to, yeah, anyway, that's a whole other thing. It just makes me kind of laugh as, he, as I think about what might be going on in his head. As he says, take my right of redemption. I'm not going there. Take my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So it would have messed up his inheritance again for whatever reason. We don't know for sure. And he was unwilling to do it, and it opens the door for Boaz to do it. And so he becomes the kinsman redeemer. And so then we come to the falling action. And this is where the story begins to resolve itself, begins to work itself out. And so in the fourth chapter, verse 13, and so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. And then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. And then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. So Boaz and Ruth in this, in this falling action, Boaz and Ruth marry. She conceives a, a son. Uh, Naomi is finally a grandmother. Uh, Boaz becomes this kinsman redeemer. And I love the picture of what's being concluded here. Naomi goes from, from the opening chapter, living a life of tragedy and tragedy after tragedy after tragedy and, and describing herself as, Mara, I'm just bitter. She goes from that till now she see, we see her with a life of blessing. A life that had been filled with tragedy now filled with blessing and and what they the other women they say to her you have a you have a daughter-in-law who loves you which is better than seven sons and that was quite a statement in their culture for them to have said that so no one now is looking at her as bitter anymore her life has changed and then we have the final piece the resolution of the story and the resolution of the story is the prince finding Cinderella and the slipper fits and they get married and they live happily ever after. And so chapter 4 is that moment. Verse 17, And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, the child, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. That's King David. In other words, Ruth the Moabite, the foreign-born Moabite, looked at, these people looked at as the enemies of the people of, of Israel, but now... Uh, she's not an enemy. That's not the way God sees her. And, and, and here she uh, is going to be the great-grandmother of King David, the ancestor of our Savior. Through the line of, so Ruth being a part of that line, Boaz and Ruth, and then they have a child and child, and then King David and, and Jesus, the Messiah, the Redeemer for all of us would come through this line. Our Redeemer. So look of Ruth in a sense, begins and ends with the bookends of great stories, the way they've been told for centuries and centuries and centuries. Once upon a time. And the end, the other bookend is, and they lived happily ever after. And so once upon a time, Naomi, with her family in the midst of difficulty, during the time of the judges, during a famine, decided to chart their own course, leave the promised land, uh, walk away from, from this space of God's blessing and do their own thing, and they walk into this foreign land of Moab to carve out a better life, and their better life for Naomi becomes a bitter life. But then the story ends in chapter 4, in which basically reads, we get summarized, and they lived happily ever after. So let's conclude with a final piece, the classic piece of the way we look at story, 
and to think about what is the moral then of the story. And the moral of the story, a couple things I want to point out. First is this. God continues to go back in this book. He doesn't, and we see Naomi, and it's, it's interesting how, how God doesn't forget Naomi. That, that Ruth seems to be, and Boaz, and the, them, you know, this whole piece seems like that's the key piece. But then God keeps inserting Naomi and keeps talking about Naomi. And, and it's, it, she's not an afterthought. And I don't know what your journey, where your journey takes you, but if your journey is similar to Naomi's, and life tragedy has touched your life, and you are a widower. I just want to remind you that we see in this story that in the midst of tragedy, she finds hope. That right alongside Ruth, she finds redemption as well. And we see that throughout Scripture, through the scripture, story of Scripture, that God has a concern for widows and those that have experienced tragedy and loss. And so again, if that's your, if that's your world, that you, that's, that's your path that you walk on today, be encouraged that God loves you, that God cares about you, that God sees you, that he is for you. A second thing that, that we see, uh, and I, I mentioned it, but I just want to talk a little bit more, is that God's providence in this world and in our lives, that he can work his providence despite the, the disobedient detours that we sometimes take, defined Providence, to define it, is the way that God actively sustains and guides this world and our lives toward his purposes. And there are times that, that, that we get off because of our own dumb decisions, our own sinful decisions. And just like, just like Naomi, she goes out of the promised land into this land, into Moab, and leaves the promised land. We take those detours as well of disobedience. And sometimes the detours that we take are the result of someone else being disobedient, someone else sinning against us, and that blows our lives up because someone else does something. And sometimes just this crazy broken world that we live in, there's stuff that happens that, that, that also detours our life. And I just want to encourage you that in God's providence, that God, as we, uh, as, we, as we submit to him and as we trust him, that God can move in our lives in his providence to push us back towards his purpose, that there is hope that I can trust that God is for me as I submit my life. That he's working for my good and I can trust him. This week, we, uh, this past week, our new, the director of our new men's transition home, our restoration house that we're calling it, I had a chance to meet him for the first time. And as he was telling me a story, he talked about how he had come himself out of his own uh, path and uh, background in addiction and that God had kind of laid on his heart this idea of a, of a place where men and people could find, find a second chance. And that had been this dream that God had planted for a long time. And now God, in his providence, has woven that around to he's going to be the director of this space. That's what God can do in your life as you trust him. The third thing that I would say is that God works through his providence. I want to remind us to bring Ruth, a Moabite foreigner, into his story, into his big redemption story. She would become the great-grandmother to King David. God purposefully included Ruth. This is not an accident that Ruth, the non-Jewish Moabite, that would have been looked down on in her day, looked at as an enemy, that God includes her in his grand redemption story. And it's a reminder for all of us that we really also should look at people as God sees them. That we should strive to go around the world and and to see people, God didn't see her as the enemy, that God saw her as someone that he wanted to be in this line to remind us that he cares for all people. And his heart is that none be lost, but all saved. And to work towards that, to strive to see people as God sees them. And then the last thing, the friends, the reminder that we see in this story that God is in the redemption business. That he has made a way through the person of Jesus Christ to redeem humanity. He has made a way through the person of Jesus Christ to redeem you and to redeem me. And we see a beautiful picture here in this short chapter. Mentioned some 20 times this idea, this concept of redemption. We see in this short book, 85 verses, Jesus as the ultimate kinsman redeemer. 
the, uh, us who couldn't fix it on our own, couldn't, couldn't make a way on our own, couldn't redeem ourselves on our own, and a kinsman redeemer came to pay the price that we could not. Boaz paying the price to redeem them that they could not pay, had no capacity to pay on their own. That's what Jesus does for us, to bring us back into the family. And so my question, as our worship team comes back out, have you submitted to Jesus Inviting him, as Ruth invited Boaz to be the kinsman redeemer, have you invited Jesus to be your kinsman redeemer? I would encourage you today to make that decision. We've, here in the sanctuary, it gives us a place to have a space, these altars. And if you today, I don't know what God may be saying to you today, but if you'd like to come and pray, and you want to pray on your own, you can come over here, and you're welcome to pray on your own. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, we've got some people that would love to have the opportunity and the privilege of praying with you. If you want to invite Christ to be your kinsman redeemer, I'd invite you to come. If you have a, have a need in your life, it's a physical need, it's something going on in your family, if you're, you're, you're walking out a, a Naomi, Ruth, crazy story, and you, you just need the family, somebody to come alongside you and pray over you, whatever the situation is, we would love to pray with you. Let's stand as we worship, as we conclude. Father God, I pray that... You would just work in our hearts and our lives as we think about the story and how it relates to us. This big upper story, but God, how it relates to our own story and what we learn from it and need to apply into our own story. Thank you, God, that in your providence you are working us, pushing us towards your purposes. Help us, God, not to work against that, but to trust you by faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray.